Hello, my name is Clara Caldera, and in this video, I'm presenting this paper titled Towards Supporting Data-Driven Practices in Stroke Telerehabilitation Technology. I am a postdoc researcher at IU Bloomington, and this paper is part of my dissertation work at UC Irvine. In this work, we investigated both existing and potential use of telerehab data by stroke survivors and healthcare providers. Well, stroke is a neurological condition that affects millions of people every year. It's also a leading cause of serious long-term disability. Recovery is a long and difficult process that can take from a few weeks to several years. Rehabilitation involves gradually regaining motor and cognitive function through physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, and so on. However, most stroke survivors have very limited access to the services. And as a consequence, they do not recover as well as they could. Rehabilitation care, such as physical therapy, requires frequent one-on-one -on -one sessions with healthcare providers. And this can keep be cost prohibitive. Even among people who have health insurance coverage, these services are often limited to a few sessions. And having access to the services is crucial because it can determine if the person will regain the ability to cook, drive, and even work. Telerehabilitation or telerehab is an approach for rehabilitation through telehealth, and it can help to expand access to healthcare services for stroke survivors. It can be less costly and help to overcome barriers related to transportation, social distancing, and so on. But it also shares some of the same limitations of telehealth and remote collaborative work. The communication between patients and clinicians is limited in comparison with face-to-face -face interactions. And as you'd expect, the communication influences the rehabilitation outcomes. So we conducted a qualitative study in collaboration with clinician clinical researchers who created the telerehab or TR system. The system is pictured here in the slide. It was designed to translate physical therapy and occupational therapy exercises into games. Because the exercises require different kinds of movements, the system includes many different sorts of input, including archaeo style buttons, uh, re-remote, and others. So this diagram illustrates how this collaboration took place. On the left, we have a 12-week clinical study conducted by researchers in neurology and physical therapy uh, that we call clinical researchers. And on the right, this qualitative project that I'm presenting in this video. Participants were both patients and providers who use the telerehab system in the clinical study. And for the qualitative study, we ran a focus group with four clinicians. They were two physical therapists and two occupational therapists. And we interviewed 10 stroke survivors after the period of using the telerehab system for 12 weeks. During the clinical study, the patients used the system for around an hour, six days per week, and they had a virtual appointment with clinicians every two weeks. And the four clinicians managed the games prescribed to each stroke survivor based on their abilities and goals for rehabilitation. In between appointments, patients and clinicians could access some of the data collected by the system, including a log of what games were played and performance measured through game points. So pictured here on the left is a screen displaying game points as it was shown to participants after finishing a game session. In the study, we wanted to understand how this data were used and perceived, both by stroke survivors and by the clinicians. So we asked them about their experiences during those 12 weeks. For example, how much they paid attention to the data and how they interpreted the points. And to understand more broadly how they perceive the data, we created a set of data visualization artifacts. Here are a few examples of the different artifacts used in the study. Our purpose was not to evaluate their design, but to use them to prompt discussion in the focus group and interviews. 
Stroke survivors were shown visualizations of their own data in different formats and levels of granularity. For example, here in the upper left, we have a line graph showing the points of a specific game over time. So let's look at the results. Among the stroke survivors, we found a very strong preference for data that confirms that they are still improving, but not necessarily data about whether they are improving or not. There was a very clear, explicit preference for receiving encouragement. To that end, the data that showed a plateau or a decline would be seen as something negative. In addition to encouragement, participants wanted actionable information about what they could do more or better to continue improving. Their focus was primarily on the future, on rehabilitation goals that they had not yet achieved. And that was because they felt that they already understood the progress that they had made up to that point. But because the progress was very gradual, it was difficult to see it in the short term. So they saw the data as an indication of their recent rate of progress. And if they are making progress, that means that they can expect to see more improv improvements in the future and potentially achieve their goals. Clinicians expressed that they needed information that would help to determine what they should prescribe. That included any existing issues that the patients were experiencing, such as pain, and also determining the right level of difficulty is and how it changes over time. They also wanted to know that the stroke survivors had the right exercise form and whether they were following the prescribed routine of exercises. Overall, the focus of the healthcare providers was really on the present, or in other words, understanding the patient needs and whether they have changed. And past data, particularly recent past, would help them to understand it. So here you can see that the perspectives of clinicians and patients were quite different. Overall, uh, both patients and clinicians had separate data practices. This is different from prior work where patient data such as symptom diary could be discussed together in a clinical visit. Here, the information that they seek from the data would otherwise be provided by the other person if they were in a regular in-person session. Both of them were interested in understanding progress over time, but they had different needs in terms of granularity, temporality, and framing. Altogether, these findings reveal a challenge around how we can promote encouragement when the data could be perceived in a negative way, particularly for more ambiguous data, such as a plateau, as it could be interpreted both as the absence of progress and as successfully maintaining function over time. So these findings help us to understand the needs of these different stakeholders in the context of that recap. More broadly, we also reflect on design involving working with data that are personally meaningful to the user. Because while these perspectives are not always aligned, they also might be combined into a single role through design. For example, when users collect personal information and need to make decisions based on that data themselves. That could be the case of a tele-rehab system designed to require little or no input from healthcare providers. I would like to invite you to check our paper for more detailed findings and a more in-depth discussion. Thank you.